Hi, um, I want to update everyone who is wanting to attend healing school but you haven't been able to yet. I just want to kind of go over some of the stuff that we've been going over and just share with you the lesson for today because I know we have a couple of people that are going to be joining us next week uh, via Skype or some other internet way that however we can get it live streamed so I want to catch you up and what we've been talking about over the past few weeks is uh, first of all you know you want to give the Word of God place in in your life whether you're trying to receive healing or trying to minister healing um, we need to give the word first place and we need to recognize that God sent his word and it healed you and it delivered you from your diseases and um, that's in Psalms 107 20 and you know if you if you're sick and you have to go to the ER or the doctors you spend a lot of time doing that you spend a lot of time uh, you know driving to the ER sitting in the ER by the time you see the doctor you're about four or five hours into it and uh, then you see the doctor and then there's more waiting and then you get a prescription from the doctor and he says you got to take it you know maybe three times a day for two weeks and um, then you go home and you take the medicine and eventually you start feeling better now before I go any further, I want to let you know, uh, we love doctors. We're so thankful to God for doctors because many people need them, and it's okay. It's okay to go to the doctor if you need to, but what I'm saying is if we could at least give the Word uh, just as much time as we give the doctors, just as much time as we give the ER, just as much, you know, intake the Word just as much as you take in medicine, you're going to see healing in your life. You're going to see changes in your life. In fact, many times people see a complete miracle within the first four or five hours of just studying the Word of God concerning healing. So this is very exciting. Uh, the Word works. Um, I heard T.L. Osborne uh, preach one time. He said, you guys are waiting for me to quit preaching so you can get your healing and I'm waiting for you to get your healing so that I can quit preaching because the Word is powerful and it's active and it's, and it's full of life. You know, Jesus says, my words are spirit and they are life. And uh, then Proverbs 4, 20 and 22, it tells us that the Word of God is actually health to all of our flesh. So we've got to take in the Word so that we can, so that we can have health and life to our flesh. Okay, the Word of God is powerful and it always accomplishes what it's set out to do. It never comes back void. Um, and if we'll just give the Word of God place, if we'll just listen to the Word, sit under the Word, study the Word, read the Word, then uh, we'll be healed because the Word of God says that. Amen? Um, now, the first healing school we went over, God's Will to Heal, and we looked at the um, case where the leper comes to Jesus and he says, you know, I know you can heal me if you will. And... Um, we need to understand that Jesus said, I will be thou clean. And the Lord isn't going to play favoritisms, you know. God is no respecter of persons, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's very exciting because that means you might be sitting there wondering, well, I kind of kind of hope God will heal me. I know he can. He's all powerful, but will he? I'm going to tell you right now, God says, I will. Be thou clean, be made whole, be healed. The Lord wants to heal you. It's his desire to heal you. In fact, it's by Jesus' stripes we were healed. So he's already put, you know, Jesus has already given provision for that healing um, a long time ago. And you can't really question if something is someone's will if they've already done it because we know it's their will. Like if it was your will to get up and, and go make a snack, then you'd get up and go make a snack and you'd be eating your snack and somebody wouldn't have to come along and say, well, I wonder if it's your will to go make a snack. Of course it's your will. You've already done it. So that's the that's what the Word says. Of course it's God's will to heal you. He's already done it. He's already provided everything you need in His Word for life and godliness. He's already blessed you with every blessing and um, praise God. So I'm just going to go into the lesson that we did today and um, I'm going to trust the Lord to uh, 
just give you revelation of his word and to let this word come into you and start working that healing in you that the Lord has for you. Because remember, the word of God is spirit and it's life and it's health to all your flesh. So let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the people who are watching this video, Lord. I thank you, God, that you have sent your word and it has healed them and has delivered them from their diseases. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you speak to them from the inside, Lord, with that inward witness, God, as they hear my voice and you speak to them through me, Lord God. Prepare their hearts for this lesson. I thank you that you have, and I thank you that you're giving it to them at the exact right time for them to be able to receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so if you don't have your Bible, you want to pause and go and get your Bible because we're going to be looking at some scripture today. And I want you to open to uh, Luke chapter 6. Okay, we're going to start in Luke chapter 6. And the other opening I want you to open to is Mark and chapter 3, okay? We're going to look at those. And I'm just going to start reading here for a minute. And then we'll, um, I'm going to read actually in Mark chapter 3. And then we'll go back over to Luke 6. So hold those two spots in the Bible. It's the same miracle, it's just different accounts. One is Mark's account of this miracle and one is Luke's account. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna kinda break down this miracle in the Bible and we're gonna see what happened, what did Jesus do, what was happening in the surrounding, you know, in the situation and everything, and what did the person do? How did they receive the healing? How did Jesus minister the healing? And we're just gonna take a really good look at it, okay? So Mark chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he said unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he said, saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, to save life, or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked around, round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsels with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Okay, so let's turn over to Luke chapter 6, and we'll look at that. We're going to start in verse 6, and it says, And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, and they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts, and he said unto the man which had a withered hand, Rise up, stand forth in the mist. And he arose, and he stood forth. And then Jesus said unto, unto them, I will ask you one thing, is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. And they were filled with madness and communed one with another that what they might do to Jesus. Okay, so we've read the scriptures and now we're just going to kind of break it down and just get some, go deep into these scriptures and find out exactly uh, what's going on from all kinds of angles, okay? So we're reading in Luke chapter 6. And we're starting in verse 6, and it says, And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue, and he taught. Now remember, we were talking about um, how the Lord sent his word, and it healed you. And in fact, um, Psalm 119.50 says that the thy word has quickened me. Okay, it's the word of God that has... Uh, has quickened. It's the word that's powerful and active. And, um, you know, we did another lesson too, I guess the second week we did uh, was hear and be healed. And um, when we were looking at Luke chapter 5 and 
verse 15 and everything where Jesus was just healing multitudes of people. They came forward, they came from all around uh, to hear and to be healed of their diseases. So they knew that they needed to hear the word of God first and then they could be healed. So that just confirms the scripture in Psalm 107, 20 where it says he sent his word and it healed them and it delivered them from their destructions. And in, Psalm, and in Proverbs 4, 22 that says that his word is life to all those who find it and health to all their flesh. That is your physical being. God's word is actually health to your physical being, which is very exciting. So this is what Jesus was doing and what was going on in this miracle is that he was teaching in the synagogue. And then there was a man whose right hand was withered. Uh, when I was studying this out, I noticed in, in Luke that it says his right hand was withered. And so I wondered, what is the significance of the right hand? Because if we notice, there's about 20 of these um, healing miracles that are listed throughout Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And um, Jesus healed multitudes and multitudes of people. So how... You know, what significance is it that this particular one is in the Word of God for us? Um, so we ought to look at a little, little bit closer than uh, just some book and see exactly what the Holy Spirit would have us see in it. And it says that his right hand was withered. So I looked up the significance of the right hand, and uh, the right hand represents strength and authority and power. And so his strength was withered, his authority was withered, and his power was withered. But it was his physical right hand that was withered. And um, if we look in the Word of God, let's turn over to Isaiah. And we're going to look in chapter 63 of the book of Isaiah. Now I didn't mark all these in my Bible, so i got to turn myself. I'll give you a minute to turn or to Google, or if you're going to BibleGateway.com and you want to type in Isaiah 63, um, we're going to go to verse, verse 12, and it says, That led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name. So the Lord leads people by their right hand, okay? The right hand represents strength and authority and power, and this is the way that God leads his people. Okay, the right hand also um, is the, the right side, is the side on which God marches with us into battle. And um, that is in Isaiah or I'm sorry, Psalms uh, 109, 31, and Psalms 110, verses 1 and 5. And God overcame his enemies with his right hand. So let's stay in Isaiah and look at uh, chapter 62, which should be really close, in verse 8. And it says, The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength. The Lord's right hand is the arm of his strength. Okay, this is very significant. And then let's look over at Exodus uh, chapter 15 and verse 6. Let me just turn there. Exodus 15 and verse 6, it says, Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, has dashed in pieces the enemy. You know, we know it's the enemy that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And God has come to bring us life and life more abundantly. Jesus came that we could have life and life more abundantly. And it is the right hand of God that dashes our enemy into pieces. That will just dash that sickness into pieces and break it up and get it out of your physical body. It's the right hand of God that will do this. So this is the significance of the right hand. It's pretty it's pretty significant, but his right hand was withered. 
And then in verse 7 it says, And the scribes and Pharisees watched him, whether they would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might find accusation against him. You know, there were the scribes and Pharisees of the... Um, of the day were kind of like some of the religious leaders of the day and the religious people that are um, they are, they're appointed by God okay but they're denying the power of God the scribes and Pharisees weren't there to learn anything they were there to accuse Jesus okay and many times in the healing ministry when you're if you're trying to minister healing or if you're even if you're trying to receive healing you know you might have some really good Christians that try to come against you and try to tell you no you can't be healed or or something like that and and Jesus um you know, he puts us in here for a reason, the Holy Spirit does, and says that the, the scribes and Pharisees were there, but they weren't there to learn anything, okay? They were just there to accuse him. Um, so let's find out, and let's turn over to Matthew chapter 23 and read just a little bit more about the scribes and the Pharisees and uh, what Jesus says about the scribes and the Pharisees so that we can um, kind of get an understanding of the type of people that were in the crowd this day, okay, when Jesus was doing this healing and, and teaching, okay? Matthew uh, chapter 23, we're going to start in verse 13, and these are the woes unto the scribes and Pharisees, and it says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, neither you suffer them that are entering to go in. You know, there's going to be religious leaders that try to stop you from receiving your healing. And it's not okay. It's not okay. You know, in 2 Timothy, um, let me see, it's in 2 Timothy, right? and I think it's chapter, uh, let's see, chapter 3. Yeah, chapter 3 and verse 5, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5, it says, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Okay, so we have the same thing going on in some churches today and in some religious organizations today as uh, Jesus did back in his day. And these, these people were part of the crowd. They came to hear Jesus, not to learn anything, but uh, just to just to accuse him, okay? And they're, sit, they're sitting there trying to shut up the kingdom of God. Um, they're not going to enter it in themselves. They're not, they don't have any interest of entering in. They're not there to hear and be healed. They're there so that they can accuse Jesus. And, um, and they're also trying to stop other people from entering in. And there's, you know, I'm not trying to get on a um, a tangent here about the church today, but when we're receiving and ministering healing, we need to be aware of this, that this is going on even in the church today. And, you know, good people will fight you for to stop you from receiving your healing and to stop you from believing. Um, and then it says in verse 14, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore you shall receive a greater damnation. Uh, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you made him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Okay, now these religious people of the day, the scribes and the Pharisees, they would go over land and sea to find the right person to mold in their image and to raise up to be one of their own, one of their scribes or Pharisees. And Jesus is saying, look, you guys go from land and sea to search out these people. And when you raise them up, they're twice the son of hell that you are. And it's not okay. And we see that today. We see it all over today, you know. They, the people are, some people are in religious organizations are 
traveling all over looking for people that are they, they can mold in, in their image instead of after the image of Christ and uh, they end up being twice the son of hell than the religious leader and it's not okay. Um, so we, we have the same thing going on today. So let's see what else he says about the scribes and the Pharisees. He says, uh, Woe unto you, you blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing, but whosoever sh shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Okay, Jesus is calling the scribes and Pharisees blind guides. You know, they don't see. They don't know what they're doing. They don't understand. They don't perceive. They're blinded at this point in time. And he says, You're fools, you fools and blind, for whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold. You know, the temple that sanctifies the gold is greater than the actual gold itself. And then we're going to read um, in verse... Uh, let's read in verse 23 it says woe unto you scribes and Pharisees you hypocrites for you pay tithe of mint and ansi and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law judgment and mercy and faith you know the scribes and Pharisees they paid their tithes they did this now Jesus says you ought to have not you ought to have done this and not left the other undone so he's not telling them that they shouldn't have paid their tithes but what he is telling them is that hey you should have judgment and mercy and faith you know you really got to have this and and Jesus says in verse 24 you blind guides he calls them a blind guide again cuz they're they're leading people but they're they don't know where they're leading them cuz they're blind they're not seeing and he says you strain at a gnat and swallow a camel in other words the religious people of Jesus's day were running around telling people oh you can't do this you can't do that and yet they were swallowing bigger sin than that. They were doing it themselves, and it's not okay. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you made clean the outside of the cup of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, for you are like unto whited sceptres, uh, which indeed bear beautiful outward, but are within, full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So Jesus is saying, listen, these scribes and Pharisees, these people that were the religious people of his day, they were like tombs. They were beautiful on the outside to honor the, the dead and the deceased, but on the inside, they were full of dead man's bones, okay? This is what happens when you have a form of godliness and you deny the power. This is what you look like. And we have that going on today in the church and outside of the church and in all kinds of religions all over. You know, they have a form of godliness. They seem like they're good. They seem really pretty on the outside. They seem all polished and put together. You know, they're constantly doing and doing and doing, but they're denying the power of God. Where's the power? You know, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. Everyone who believes the gospel is the power of God. And if they're denying the power, they're denying the gospel which is not okay. All right, so let's look back over in Luke chapter 6. So now you have some kind of an idea of the crowd that was around. And remember, they weren't there to hear and be healed. They were there to accuse Jesus. That's why they came, okay? So it says, um, But Jesus knew their thoughts and said, and said unto the man with the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the mist. He said, rise up and stand forth in the mist. You know, sometimes 
you have to rise up and stand forth in the midst of all the religious people that are telling you that healing's not for today. You know, if you want to receive your healing, you sometimes have to go against the grain. You've got to get a hold of the Word of God and stand forth. You've got to rise up in the midst of these scribes and these Pharisees, in the midst of your religious leaders that tell you that, that God doesn't heal today, that healing is passed away, or that you know God heals sometimes, but He doesn't heal all the time. People that deny the power of God, you've got to rise up and stand forth in the midst of them, okay? because you really want to receive your healing. And I know some people who are watching this video for you, it's a matter of life and death, okay? Choose life, that's what I'm saying. Choose life. The gospel is the power of God. There is so much power contained in these words. If you'll receive them, you will be healed because God's word never comes back void, but it always accomplishes what it's set out to do. And now is your time for healing. Amen. Now is the time for healing. So let's continue looking at this um, miracle. Rise up and stand forth in the midst of these religious leaders. They're, they're denying the power, but that doesn't mean it's not so, okay? We're not going to exalt their experience over the Word of God. We're not going to exalt your experience over the Word of God either. We're not going to exalt anything over the Word of God because the Word of God is the highest authority, okay? What God says goes. It's the truth. The Word of God is the actual truth, okay? And if the Lord says, I have sent my Word and it has healed you, then he has sent his word and he has healed you and praise God the manifestation is coming. Amen. So um, rise up and stand forth no matter what, no matter, you know, if you got a diagnosis and people around you were saying to you, oh, God doesn't heal today. God heals some, but not all. Or don't go to this ministry or that ministry because you know, somebody died after they prayed for them. Well, you know, you wouldn't use that same logic at the hospital. Many people die in the hospital every day, under treatment, ongoing treatment, and they just die. But that doesn't stop you from going to a hospital, does it? So why should it stop you from coming to the Word of God and to the truth and to Jesus Christ and to the gospel, which is the power of God to heal you right there where you're at? Don't let it stop you. Rise up and stand forth in the midst of them. And Jesus said, looking around, looking around at all of the scribes and Pharisees and everyone present there, he said, I'm going to ask you one thing. Is it better to do good on the Sabbath, to bring life, or to do evil and destroy life? And you know what? They couldn't say. Because if they answered, they either would have had to agree with Jesus, which was the truth, or deny Jesus, which was what they had, were doing in their heart, but then they feared man. They had a big fear of man. They were afraid if they, if they recognized Jesus, if they recognized the gospel and the power of God, they were going to lose control. They weren't going to be able to manipulate their churches anymore. They weren't going to be able to manipulate the people anymore. Okay, but if they but if they denied Jesus, all these people are there and uh, they'd look like fools and probably be beaten up as well. You know, God, God gave man a free will and you are not created to be manipulated by man. Uh, God doesn't cross your free will. He'll let you go to hell if you want to. But um, he's made provision so you don't have to. And God doesn't cross your free will. He'll let you die early if you want to. But he's already made provision so that you don't have to. You don't have to leave early. You have got a call of God on your life. Look, he has prepared good works for you to do from before the foundation of the world. It's so exciting. But you got to get healed. You got to rise up and stand forth and receive this this word of God concerning healing. You know, be brave and be bold and, and don't let the naysayers tell you any different. Don't let the people who look good on the outside, but on the inside they're full of dead man's bones. Don't let the dead 
tell you you can't live. Okay, I'm telling you, the Word of God is life to you. It's health to all your flesh. That means every time you hear the Word of God, you're getting better. Every time you hear the Word of God, you're making progress, getting healed, getting healed, getting healed. Every Word of God, the anointing is on it and in it, and it's entering into your ears, and it's going through your body, and it's healing you. And I don't know all the particulars, but um, I don't have to, praise God. I just know it works because God never lies, and His Word never comes back void. So um, this is what's going on in this miracle, is that uh, Jesus is looking around, and I want to look over in um, Mark. Remember, we're in chapter 3 here, and verse 5, and it says, Right after Jesus asked this question, And when he had looked round about on them with anger, okay? Jesus was mad at the religious people. And uh, how many know that it's a bad thing to be to have Jesus angry with you? Yeah, let's not do that, okay? But he was grieved for their hardness of heart. He was grieved. He wasn't happy. He took no pleasure in the fact that they didn't believe. He was grieved. Because if you remember these scribes and Pharisees, the woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, these guys that are, you know, they look like whitewashed tombs with dead man's bones on the inside. These guys are the chosen generation. These are the priests of the chosen generation. These guys are anointed and appointed by God. God loves them, okay? God loves them with an everlasting love. He loves them as much as he loves you and me. And he's appointed them. And uh, he was grieved. He was grieved at their hardness of heart. And uh, we can see in the scriptures here that Jesus took no pleasure in the fact that they had a hard heart. He took no pleasure in it at all because he knew they weren't going to enter the kingdom of God on their own. They didn't want to. They didn't have any interest in getting into the kingdom and into the power of God. And it, and it grieved Jesus. You know, so we, since we have the same kind of people uh, here today, in, in our time, as Jesus did in his time, we can pray for these people, you know? Um, we can pray for them. We can pray Ephesians chapter 1, like verses 17 through 20, that, that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, that they would know what is the hope of their calling and what is the inheritance in the saints. Oh my gosh, we can pray that their eyes are open to the gospel, to the power of God, okay? Because they have influence. They're, they're obviously anointed. They're obviously appointed. God has set them in position. And um, since it grieves our Lord and Master that they have a hard heart, it ought to grieve us too. We ought not be going around bashing them and talking against them. You know, there's a great lesson here in uh, Saul and David when David had many chances to kill Saul. And he said, hey, even though Saul's trying to kill me and he's running after me and he'd kill me any chance he gets, I am not going to touch the Lord's anointed. I'm not going to do it. You know, and we need to have that same attitude, okay? David was a man after God's own heart. And uh, we want to be people after God's own heart. And uh, we want to see that, hey, if it grieves Jesus, it grieves us. Okay, so we want to have a right attitude, even though we understand um, that the religious people of the day are going to have a form of godliness, and they're going to deny the power, and we have good churches that are dead on the inside, and, and it's not okay. Um, we ought not talk bad about them and... You know, I'm not saying don't recognize what's going on, but I'm...